morning, everyone. Uh, Larry, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the Buzzkirk Lecture Committee uh, for the invitation to speak. It is uh, both an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to focus attention on Dr. Buzzkirk and some of his research accomplishments. I would like to acknowledge uh, Charles Tipton, uh, that he not only provided some personal insights, but also his article on uh, Living History series on Buzzkirk and uh, Larry Kenny's interview that he conducted with Buzz both provided some keen insights into the life and times of uh, Dr. Buzzkirk. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge Jim Pawalczyk for providing numerous pictures uh, of Buzz and, and the lab for this uh, talk. Uh, Buzzkirk was born and raised in Beloit, Wisconsin. He was very active in sports, loved hockey, and played tennis at a competitive level on a regional basis. Uh, after briefly entering the University of Wisconsin, uh, he joined the U.S. Army and fought in uh, the European Theater where he received a uh, field commission. This member of the greatest generation, uh, after the war, attended St. Olaf College in Minnesota and graduated in 1950 with a B.A. in physical education and biology. The following year, or that year, he uh, entered the University of Minnesota and received in 1951 a master's degree in physical education and physiological hygiene. To better understand the uh, scientific career of uh, Dr. Buzzkirk, it'd be good to get a sense of his roots. And they begin with Ansel Keys, who received his PhD from Scripps Institution Ocean Institute of Oceanography. After that, uh, Keyes did a postdoc with August Krogh, the Nobel Prize winner. And at that point, he had an opportunity to go to Cambridge and accept the position. But instead, he went to the Harvard Fatigue Lab and worked with Dr. Dill. After he finished uh, his projects at the Harvard Fatigue Lab, he did go to Cambridge and work with Barcroft and received another doctorate in 1936. In 1938, at the University of Minnesota, he created the Laboratory for Physiological Hygiene, and he recruited Henry Longstreet Taylor, who was at Harvard uh, University and had worked in the Harvard Fatigue Lab. And Taylor did his PhD uh, with uh, Keyes. And finally, Taylor was the mentor and major professor for Buzzkirk. The PhD dissertation that Buzz did dealt with maximal oxygen intake and its relationship to body composition. And as you can see on the graph on the left with fat-free body weight on the x-axis and oxygen uptake in liters per minute on the y, the regression line in there is based on subjects who were not involved in sports. And the points above the line represent the individuals who did intramural sports, football, and the cross-country runners, indicating the role of physical activity linked to maximal oxygen uptake as expressed in this manner. And on the right, where he used only the sedentary uh, students as subjects, he examined the effect of body composition uh, categorized in 0 to 10, 10 to 15, and 25 plus percent and uh, found that the oxygen uptake per unit fat-free mass was not different among the groups. In essence, physical activity was a primary determinant once uh, you took care of the percent body fat. Uh, in 1954, <coughs> Buzzkirk went to the Quartermaster Research Lab in Natick, Massachusetts, and, uh, and the, uh, his mentor, uh, Austin Henschel, one of his mentors at Minnesota, uh, at the Laboratory for Physiological Hygiene, was the director of that program. And it resulted in a smooth transition for Buzz in terms of the kinds of questions being asked and the methodology involved. At the lab, they focused on the role of variables like nutrition, training, climatization, on the physiological responses and performance responses of subjects during exercise and environmental challenges. And what's important uh, is that they use a wide variety of subjects in terms of characteristics that varied in terms of race, fitness, fatness, hydration level, and so on, to get a better understanding of how individuals respond to these challenging environments. In 1957, he, was, he accepted a position of physiologist at NIH, and he was director of the Metabolic Chamber Facility and Program 
And he examined, the program examined variables, for example, caloric intake on metabolism, including during sleep. And remember, this is, this is in the 1950s. And in addition, they studied the impact of a wide variety of variables, such as exercise, cold, heat, drugs, hormones, on numerous variables in populations that differed in body composition, gender, fitness, and so forth. And in this particular study, you see the uh, response of subjects who differed in terms of body composition. So it shows resting metabolic rate on the left axis and total body insulation on the X axis. And you see a very predictable response in terms of resting metabolic rate uh, due to changes in total body insulation. During the time he was at NIH, he was doing more than science. Uh, Buzz was actively involved in the development and promotion of the next generation of physiologists, and he promoted the establishment of an NIH study session, section that became a reality in 1963 that focused on environmental and exercise physiology. He also organized exercise mixers at APS meetings to facilitate the interaction among the attendees so that they'd have more time to visit with each other outside of the planned sessions. In 1963, he accepted a position as professor of applied physiology at Penn State University and was director of the Laboratory of, uh, for Human Performance Research. And this is what the lab uh, looked like when I did a postdoc there in 1969-1970. Uh, the building was originally the team room under the old stadium. And during this period of time, they were taking soil samples for the construction of no lab that is on the campus right now. The no lab as two environmental chambers, uh, an altitude chamber, as well as a clinical research center. At Penn State, Buzz focused on a number of research topics consistent with his background of physiological effects of high altitude, intervention programs of coronary heart disease, body composition assessment, uh, problems related to obesity and energy expenditure, thermal regulation, among others. He was a major professor for 28 graduate students and worked with 27 postdocs and uh, visiting professors. In 1988, he was the Marie Underhill Knoll Professor of Human Performance and received emeritus status in 1992. Buzz had many accomplishments throughout his career. He had published more than 250 research uh, publications. He was on the editorial board of numerous journals. He was a section associate editor of Journal of Applied Physiology and editor-in-chief of MSSE. And he was a consultant to numerous organizations. He was the eighth president of the American College of Sports Medicine and a fellow in at least five uh, organizations. And he's received the honor award not just from ACSM, but from other organizations, including the American Physiological Society section on environmental and exercise physiology. And last but not least, and it speaks to his service commitment, he received the DAGS Award from the American Physiological so uh, Society for the service that he rendered to that organization. <clears throat> so today, what I'm going to try and do is uh, talk about the measurement of maximal oxygen uptake from the concept to the classical paper by Taylor, Buzzkirk, and Henschel, and then summarize some current articles on the measurement of VO2 max, and then I have some observations and questions. That'll be the primary part of the talk. Uh, following that, I'll uh, talk about VO2 max and endurance performance, uh, just talking about oxygen transport, and I'll work in some of the altitude work of Buzzkirk. And last but not least, I think I have a total of three slides, since there will be absolutely no remaining time, to talk about VO2 max and the risk of chronic disease. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we had an excellent talk by Barry Franklin last year that dealt uh, with this issue. So VO2 max is an abbreviation for maximal aerobic power or maximal oxygen intake uptake, <clears throat> depending on what time you enter the programs. Uh, it's interpreted as the upper or functional limit of the cardiovascular system's ability to pump blood uh, its functional capacity. The popular meaning, of course, is cardiorespiratory or cardiovascular fitness. It is sometimes used just as a descriptive variable. In the same way that you'd report the height, weight, and percent fat of subjects, uh, you might also report their VO2 max as an important characteristic. It's used as a classification variable in epidemiological studies. Uh, best examples, uh, studies by Blair, for example. Uh, 
And it's a crucial and primary dependent variable on a number of studies to evaluate, for example, training programs, comparing moderate to vigorous exercise or environmental factors like the effect of altitude, uh, detraining studies, medications like beta blockers or ergogenic aids like blood doping. The idea and concept for maximal oxygen uptake comes to us from a paper by Hill and Lupkin in 1923. They introduced the term steady state, oxygen requirement, and maximal oxygen uptake. And this quote, which has been used uh, a lot over, over the years, the rate of oxygen consumption increases as speed increases, at reaching a maximum for speeds beyond 260 meters per minute. However much the speed be increased beyond that limit, no further increase in oxygen uptake can occur. And on this uh, slide from that paper, you see that by about <clears throat> two and a half minutes, uh, during the submaximal work at 181 and 203 meters per minute, oxygen uptake uh, leveled off and continued that way for the remainder of the run. At the 267 minute speed, the subject, who happened to be Hill, recognized that as a non-sustainable speed. And he thought it was maximal oxygen uptake, so calling it an apparent steady state. But because no higher speeds were evaluated, could not conclude that maximal oxygen uptake had been reached. The following year, in a study by Hill, Long, and Lupton, additional uh, data points at higher speeds were obtained, showing, without question, a plateau in VO2 max at higher running speeds. Now, in the Laboratory for Physiological Hygiene, consistent with the roots that Keyes had, consistent with the Harvard Fatigue Lab, they studied a broad range of questions. <clears throat> and part of what they studied was the long-term impact of variables like nutrition and physical activity on body composition. And the classic study by Keyes, Broshek, and, and Henschel on the biology of human starvation is a case in point. Uh, now, Buzz was a, uh, aware of this study when he was looking for graduate school. Uh, at the end of World War II, especially in Holland, he came face to face with individuals starving. And when he was looking for graduate school, this influenced his uh, decision to attend the University of Minnesota. The classic paper needs to be understood in that context. The VO2 max measured uh, in a Taylor, Buzzkirk, and Henschel paper in 1955, the focus was on a quality measurement that can evaluate changes over time when you're evaluating the effect of different variables. Very much consistent with so many other studies done at the Laboratory for Physiological Hygiene. Uh, they, objected, they developed objective standards for their testing procedures that suited their lab and the ability to get reproducible values. Subjects warmed up, then they ran at a fixed speed of seven miles an hour for three minutes. Uh, the grade change was two and a half percent for that test. It was a discontinuous test with hours or days between tests or stages. And oxygen uptake was measured from 145 to 245 into the three minute stage. An increment of 2.5% at that speed requires about 4.2 mils per kilogram minute, or about 300 mils for their subject based on their body weight. The criterion was equal to one half that. So the criterion that you read about and see in all the publications is less than 150 mils per minute or less than 2.1 milliliters per kilogram minute. That, of course, is unique to their protocol. It should not be used, of course, by other protocols that don't match up with the expectation. If a change in VO2 exceeded that uh, criterion, the subject was brought back for another test. So on this figure, you see the results of four subjects and their oxygen uptake response to percent grade on the x-axis. And you see different patterns of response. Uh, in only seven of 115 tests did the subjects fail to achieve the plateau criterion I outlined in a previous slide. It was a highly reliable test, which of course it had to be, given the types of studies that they were doing, evaluating changes over time. The R was 0.95 for reliability, and the standard error of the mean was only 2.4%, indicating a very tight control in terms of measurement quality. It's important to note this paper has been cited over 1,200 times, and, uh, which is extraordinary. It wasn't the only criteria for VO2 max. Uh, Austrian used an absolute plateau. Mitchell used a uh, change of less than 54 mils versus an expectation of 142. Irma Ostrand, less, uh, less than 80 mils per minute versus an expectation of 300. 
is a cut less than 100 mils per minute versus an expectation of 300, and coming and freeds in less than 50 with an expectation of 100 mils per minute. In every case, all are based on discontinuous protocols. <coughs> Now, in 1965, Glassford and others uh, had subjects do the Taylor Protocol, the Mitchell Protocol, and the Irma Austrian Protocol, and using each of the authors' own criteria, the 150, 54, and 80 mils per minute that I showed you on the previous slide. The subjects achieved the criterion, and then after the criteria were met, the subjects did an extra load. And they reported that several subjects, the number was not given, had significant increases in VO2 max. Now, part of the reason for this may have been the fixed sampling period that was associated with some of the protocols. For example, in the Taylor, Buzzkirk, and Henschel protocol, sampling was at 145 to 245 into the test. And if you take a look at the study by Austrian and Salt, uh, Saltine in 1961, and you look at the work rate of 1,800 kilopound meters per minute, you see that the maximal oxygen uptake, the VO2 is on the y-axis and time on the uh, x-axis for this subject, that the VO2 max was the same as achieved at 21, 24, 2700 kPm per minute. Now, for the 1800 kPm per minute, if the subject had been, if the gas sample had been obtained earlier in the test, for example, before three minutes, you would not have measured maximal oxygen uptake in that subject because the test didn't go long enough in that case. Now, the question, can every one receive a plateau? This is uh, definitely not news. Some studies uh, found that most stu uh, subjects could see, re uh, excuse me, achieve a plateau in maximal oxygen uptake. However, others found that only 60 to 80% of the subjects and others less than 50%. And I'll show you some studies later that are very consistent with the 50% or lower number. The variation probably is related to the population being studied, the ergometer being used, and the type of protocol. Some were continuous, some were discontinuous, some had uh, larger rates of change, some had smaller rates of change, and so on. Now, historically, VO2 max was measured by these discontinuous protocols, as I mentioned to you earlier, and they usually went for about three to six minutes. However, throughout the 1960s, there was a development of a lot of continuous protocols, for example, the Balky protocols, uh, Bruce protocols, those of Austrian and Salton, and so forth. And the question that was, arose at this time, is VO2 max the same for continuous versus discontinuous protocols? And I've put up some examples on the right side of the slide. In 1971, Max Hood and others uh, compared the Taylor Protocol in both formats and found that the continuous uh, VO2 max for the continuous test in mils per kilogram minute was 55.6 versus 55.2. McGardle did comparisons on both cycle ergometer and treadmill protocols. For the cycle ergometer, the values were 49.9 and 50.0. And the treadmill protocol, uh, there was one continuous test at 55.5 and two discontinuous versions, and both of them achieving values virtually identical to that. Neither of the studies reported what percent of the subjects achieved the plateau. In 1997, Duncan and others did, and used the Taylor protocol in a continuous and discontinuous uh, format. For continuous format, it was 55.8, discontinuous 56.8. The plateau is only 50% for the continuous and only 60% for the discontinuous. So very much consistent with the previous slide showing that a lot of studies find plateau values being uh, just about half the subjects. Now, there's been a renewed interest after the year, uh, in the early 2000s on a measurement of maximal oxygen uptake. And the emphasis has been on the validation of VO2 max, both between days as well as within days. A variety of protocols were used, the classic, for example, Taylor type protocol, as well as RAMP protocols. And in the RAMP protocol, the uh, work rate is changing uh, continuously over the course of the test at a certain uh, uh, increase in power output uh, per second or per minute. Uh, different instrumentation was used. Some used classic Douglas bags, others used mixing chamber systems, others used breath by breath. And finally, plateau criteria, in some cases, the regular standard plateau criteria or one suited to their, program, uh, their protocol was used, while others uh, developed new protocol uh, ideas for a plateau where the measured VO2 max value was compared to something extrapolated 
from submaximal responses. And I'll show you that in a variety of studies in the next few slides. In a study by Day and others in 2003, they used a continuous ramp protocol on a cycle uh, using breath-by-breath -breath gas exchange. They had 71 subjects. The rate of increase was 15 to 25 watts per minute, and the subjects continued until fatigue. 38 of the 71 subjects did a constant load follow-up test on another day at 90% of the peak work rate achieved on that test. So 38 did another test on another day at 90% of the peak work rate, and, um, and I'll report that in just a second. And finally, six of the subjects did additional very heavy intensities to the limits of tolerance on other days, and VO2 peak was measured in the last 30 seconds of each test. The existence of a plateau, as I mentioned on the previous slide, was based on extrapolating a line from submaximal values to see where the final value uh, was. And as you can see, probably not from the back, unfortunately, in this room, uh, is that the measured value exceeded the extrapolated value in 19 of the 71 subjects. In 40 of the subjects, the measured value equaled the extrapolated value. And in only 12 subjects, 17% of the subjects, a plateau was achieved, meaning that the measured value was less than that extrapolated from submaximal values. Now, in the follow-up test or validation test that was used by Day's um, group, and again, this follow-up test was done on a subsequent day, 38 subjects were tested, and it was 90% of the peak work rate achieved in a RAM protocol. The VO2 max was identical, 3.64 liters per minute, on both the follow-up protocol as well as the RAM protocol. And the 95% confidence interval was 40 mils per minute, indicating incredibly good agreement between the different protocols. Now, in the six subjects that did additional tests, in the RAM protocol, their VO2 max was 4.5 liters per minute, and in the constant load test was 4.51, indicating uh, absolute agreement. And what you see here is the RAM protocol on the left for one subject and uh, three workloads done by that subject. And what you find, very much like in that Austrian and Saltine uh, study I showed you earlier, is that the individuals working at that work rate, those different work rates, achieved the same VO2 max as they did on the RAM protocol. So the conclusions were that clear validation of VO2 max values from the RAM protocol with the constant load tests on another day. The highest VO2 max value reached on a RAM protocol could be considered VO2 max, despite no evidence of a plateau. The caveat, of course, is that without the additional test, you could not be sure. In 2006, uh, Rossiter and others uh, studied seven subjects during a RAM protocol in which the work rate was increased 20 watts per minute until fatigue. It was preceded by a warm up at 20 watts and VO2 max, or VO2 was measured by a breath-by-breath -breath, uh, system. Subjects did a five-minute recovery at 20 watts after this RAM protocol. And then they did a maximal constant load test at 105% of the peak power. Remember, in the day study, it was 90%. So they did a constant load test at 95%, of 105% of peak power output. And peak VO2 was measured in a final 15 seconds of each test. Five of the seven subjects returned on another day and repeated the RAM protocol with the follow-up test at 95% of peak work rate. So the results for the uh, full seven subjects, the RAM protocol VO2 was 4.33 liters a minute, and the constant load test at 105% of the peak work rate was 4.30 liters per minute, absolute agreement. For the five that did an additional test and then did a constant load at 95% of maximum, the VO2 max values were 4.10 liters per minute and 4.11, again indicating absolute agreement uh, between the protocols with two different uh, power outputs used in the uh, follow-up test. Rosser then pl plotted the VO2 peak values at the different work rates for each of the seven subjects. And what you see are a series of straight lines. And what that indicates is that for each subject, peak VO2 was not different across work rates, indicating that a plateau had been observed. The conclusions from this study was that plateau could be observed in follow-up tests less than peak power achieved in the RAM protocol, 
and light day, the highest VO2 measured in the RAMP protocol, even if a plateau had not been observed, could have been used as a VO2 max value. However, confirmation required additional tests, which now was shown that you could do it within days. Foster and others in 2007 uh, did successive maximal tests to evaluate this question as well, and I'm reporting here only their treadmill data. The subjects were 12 males and uh, eight females, well-trained athletes. They did an incremental test where the initial grade was 4% for males and 3% for females, and the initial speed was five miles an hour. Speed was increased one mile per hour each three minutes until exhaustion. The subjects then recovered at 0% grade for two mile, at two miles an hour for three minutes. And the constant load test that was done on that same day it was the same grade and the speed was increased either a half a mile an hour or one mile an hour above the highest achieved in the previous incremental test. Continuous 30 second oxygen uptake values were obtained. You see the incremental test on the left side of that slide and the VO2 max was 4.09 liters per minute. Following the three minute recovery, the subjects did the constant load test for three minutes and the VO2 max value was 4.03 liters per minute, indicating excellent agreement. And the conclusions from this study is that within day verification was consistent with Ross, what Rossiter and others had found, and it supports the con uh, concept of a plateau as described by Hill and Lupton. In 2007, uh, Hawkins uh, and others tested 52 well-trained male and female distance runners. Each subject did three sets of tests. And in each set of tests, there was one incremental and the following day, a constant load test. The incremental or continuous test was ten, uh, preceded by a 10 to 15 minute warm up and a five minute rest. The men ran at nine miles an hour, the women at eight miles an hour, and the initial grade was 0%. Subjects ran for two minutes. The grade was then increased 2% each two minutes until exhaustion and oxygen uptake was measured the old fashioned way with Douglas bags. The supramaximal test that occurred uh, the day after was the same warm up and rest. They ran at 8% grade and a speed to cause exhaustion in about two to four minutes. The work rate was at least 30% higher than that measured on the incremental test. And Douglas, Douglas bags during this constant load test were taken every 45 seconds. The results of this study shows that for the uh, first test, the continuous or incremental test, the VO2 max was 63.3 mils per kilogram minute. For the last four 45 second Douglas bags that you see as these bars on the graph, the VO2 max was 62.9 mils per kilogram minute for these subjects. And the conclusions was it verified VO2 max without question, and there was also no question about the plateau concept. Now the last of the studies that I'm going to uh, present is a, a, a unique study because it introduces a new plateau criteria. I think it's unique from that standpoint by Midgley and others. And in their study, they had subjects, uh, 10 runners and 10 cyclists, and they did tests on respective instruments. They warmed up for five minutes, then they did a series of one minute stages where the stage increase was one kilometer per hour increase for the runners or a 30 watt increase per minute for the cyclists. That was followed after a, a, a exhaustion that was followed by a 10 minute rest. And then the subjects worked at 50% of peak work rate for two minutes, 70% for one minute. And then the one stage was added, which was again, uh, either the one kilometer per hour or the 30 watt increment. And what they use as a plateau is the difference between a regression line based on these responses, and it was compared to the actual VO2 measurement. And so the actual VO2 measurement had to be less than 50% of the slope of the regression line. The slope for the runners was about 225 mils per minute, meaning the criterion was about 112 or 113 mils per minute. And the cyclist was 325, so the criterion would be about 162, 163 mils per minute. The VO2 max was identical between the two types of protocol, 3.96, 3.94. And 17 of 20 met the criterion for the incremental test, 
and 18 of 20 for the verification test. Now, in terms of general observations from these studies that address the plateau concept, there was no question uh, that VO2 max can be verified both within and between days. That was true across conventional protocols or RAMP protocols. And it was clear support for the Hill and Lupton concept of the plateau with progressively higher work rates. The questions that were raised by many of the authors, and I'll share this in, a, in the next, uh, this slide and the next two, is that uh, for verification tests, since uh, this is becoming uh, an important way to uh, be sure that the VO2 max value is in fact VO2 max, is how long and what kind of rest should be given after the incremental test. Because this affects the duration of the verification test. And by affecting the duration, it gives you time to collect uh, gas samples over an adequate duration so that you have better confidence in the quality of each VO2 measurement. Secondly, for the RAMP protocol, what percent peak work rate should be used? There's no question that when you achieve the peak work rate in a RAMP protocol, it's absolutely an unsteady state for a continuous one. So as we saw in Day's study, they used 90% of peak with success. In the Rossiter study, they used 105% and 95% of peak, again, with success. And so some, there needs to be some more consistency in terms of protocol development, uh, depending on the population of people involved. And the, the last part of this, in terms of just basic questions, uh, should the verification load be pre, uh, presented in a step increase, the person just suddenly works at 105% of peak work rate until exhaustion, or should it be introduced in a phased-in manner, as in Midgley, another study, where they did 50% of peak work rate and then 70%, and then being slapped with something above the 100% of peak work rate. So there's some practical issues that need to be uh, addressed uh, going forward to um, provide guidance about how uh, across laboratories people should evaluate VO2 max. And the investigators also brought up some measurement issues associated uh, with the, uh, the testing. And for example, what minimal sampling time should be used for gas exchange? And I bring this up because if you see on the right, this uh, study is from Myers and others in 1990, uh, where they used uh, breath by breath gas exchange. They had 10 healthy subjects work at 50% of VO2 max for five to 10 minutes, warm up, and then a measurement period of five minutes, clearly steady state. And this shows the standard deviation of oxygen uptake in milliliters per kilogram minute with one, two, three, and four. And if the sampling time was only 10 seconds, the standard deviation of the oxygen uptake value was about two and a half mils per kilogram minute. If it was 15 seconds, uh, it was less than two. When you got out to 20 seconds, it was about one and a half. At a 30 second um, uh, interval of gas exchange, uh, it was about uh, 1.2 or 3, and if it went out a full 60 seconds, it was less than 1 mils per kilogram minute. Now, depending on uh, how much variability exists in the gas exchange measurement, this affects both the VO2 work rate relationship determining the slope, as well as the maximal oxygen uptake where you're looking at differences across uh, time or across days. Secondly, how does the breath-by-breath breath system uh, compare to Douglas Bag methods? Now, this has been introduced as a brief commentary by Bruce Gladden earlier this year in MSSE. And uh, in the Douglas Bag method, of course, the volume and the gas fractions are all one and the same. It's tough to not have matching. They're all in the same bag, literally. Uh, in the other protocols, uh, be it mixing chamber and or breath-by-breath, breath, you're dealing with issues of matching gas fractions in time with the appropriate rate of ventilation and so forth. So it would be good to go back and do a classic comparison a la Buzzkirk with Douglas Bag collections with modern systems to uh, be sure about the value. And, and the last two things relate to uh, um, differences in terms numerically. If you measured a VO2 max, a VO2 value of 4.82 liters a minute in the next to last one and 4.78 in the last load, say, whoa, plateau. Great. If you measure the value of 4.78 liters per minute and the next one was 4.82, you go, oh, man. Are those two values different? Can you measure, truly measure, a 40 mil difference of, across 4,000? If you can operate inside a 1% and non-steady state work, I'd like to see it. 
And yet we tend not to deal with our reality to measure VO2 max in certain limits. We, we're looking for differences that may not be real. And related to that, if you accept the highest value for VO2 max, are you not introducing a systematic error? Instead of averaging two values that are within your limits of measurement, you actually pick one, which sets you up poorly if you're looking at the evaluation of change over time due to some intervening variable. And lastly, uh, what caught my eye in reading a wide variety of papers is significant numbers. Back in the day when I was learning this, there was no way on earth I could measure oxygen uptake out to the nearest milliliter per minute. But yet many papers are reporting 4,723 mils per minute for oxygen uptake. Uh, in terms of significant uh, figures, I don't think that's a possibility, but I am willing to uh, concede if somebody can show me how you can measure oxygen uptake to that limit. So additional questions that came up regarding the validation procedures is, should it be applied to all populations? And many of the authors raised questions about this in terms of children, elderly, those with chronic disease, that it may not be appropriate. And we don't want to get carried away by putting into place something that isn't necessary. And the, the other part that I think is related to this is the validation needed for every study. In epidemiological studies from a classification standpoint, using submaximal tests or no, ex no exercise test estimates of VO2 max may be adequate to classify people to evaluate the relationship between VO2 max and some particular health outcome. Obviously, if you can do a max test, as was done at Cooper Clinic, uh, the work of Blair and others, you have a much better value um, to make that judgment. If VO2 max is not the central issue and it's reported more as a descriptive characteristic, based on the studies that are being done following a systematic protocol, probably a validation test is not needed. That being said, if people are doing experimental studies and looking at small changes over time due to the interaction or the introduction of different uh, training status, different durations of training, intensity of training, and so on, uh, with VO2 max being the primary dependent variable, follow-up tests would probably be a good idea. Now, for Buzzkirk, VO2 max was not some theoretical construct. Uh, there was no question, given the genealogy, the link to the Harvard Fatigue Lab and the Laboratory for Physiological Hygiene, that it was linked to cardiorespiratory fitness and uh, linked to endurance performance. And that was true back in the Harvard Fatigue Lab days as well. And Buzz had a real interest in uh, running performance and the effect of altitude on VO2 max and performance. On the graph on the right, you see a studies that he did with Squires in 1962, 1982, excuse me. And it shows the, the subtle change that when a small change in altitude occurs going from sea level, what happens to VO2 max? Where do you begin to get the change? And so there's a real interest in trying to define the impact of altitude on VO2 max. And I'll come back to one of his studies at the end of this section of the talk. Uh, there's no question that oxygen delivery is an important variable in endurance performance. And so when you look at per, uh, all out performances with different durations, the uh, role that aerobic energy production uh, plays increases, obviously, with the duration of the performance. And by the time you get out to marathon distances and so on, virtually all the energy is coming via oxidative phosphorylation. And when you take a look at the oxygen uptake characteristics, you have to consider the variables of both the VO2 max of the subject as well as the percent VO2 max at which the subject is operating to obtain a measure of what oxygen uptake can the subject maintain during the run. And uh, Eddie Coyle calls this the uh, performance VO2. It's the oxygen uptake of the subject during a performance. The running economy of the subject translates that oxygen uptake into running velocity. Let's take a look at each of these regarding running performance. Uh, in this study by Kostel in 1973, they studied a group of runners that were heterogeneous in terms of VO2 max and performance in distance races. And we have VO2 max on the y-axis and time for a 10-mile run on the uh, x-axis. And what you see is a strong negative correlation between max VO2 and time, meaning the higher the VO2 max, the shorter the time for a 10-mile run. But what you have to keep in mind in this slide, you can get groups of subjects, as you see here, here, and here, where a VO2 max, take a look at the y-axis, VO2 max is very much the same, yet performance varies. 
And that means something else is operating. And so when you look at VO2 max, it sets the upper li limit for energy production during prolonged work, since prolonged work requires oxygen. A diverse population of runners with VO2 max uh, is inversely related to time and distance runs. And however, if the runners, you're going to find runners who have the same VO2 max, but they have differences in performance. And of course, that's bringing in the other variables of running economy and a percent of VO2 max at which the subject can perform. And so when you look at the oxygen cost of running, you have, there's a linear relationship between running speed and a performance VO2. And if an individual wanted to run a marathon in 220, that's 300 me meters per minute, for elite runners, the oxygen cost would be in a neighborhood of about 57 mils per minute. But marathons are not run at 100% of VO2 max, so the individual's VO2 max, of course, would have to be well above that uh, required oxygen requirement for the task. Uh, one of the ways to examine this was done by uh, Daniels, uh, Jack Daniels and his wife, uh, and in a study uh, in which subjects had the same VO2 max, but they differed in running economy. And when you look at the velocity, the extrapolated velocity at VO2 max, you can see the impact that a difference in running economy at the same VO2 max has on the maximum a sustainable speed based on the maximal oxygen uptake. So clearly running economy can have a dramatic effect uh, on uh, performance. And in this study by Conley and Cranebuehl, they uh, examined a group of runners who had a very narrow range of VO2 max compared to the other study I reported on maximal oxygen uptake. The subjects varied from 68 to 78 mils per kilogram minute. And as you can see, there's a strong positive correlation between time in a 10 kilometer race and oxygen uptake measured at a fixed speed of uh, 268 meters per minute. This is the oxygen cost of running at the speed for these subjects. Some were quite uneconomical with very high oxygen uptakes measured at that speed. Others were quite economical. There's a 10 milliliter per minute difference at the same running speed across these individuals. Uh, so just like in VO2 max, you can have individuals who have very similar running economy. In this case, you're looking down at the x-axis. But they differ in performance. And this is shown for both of these groups. In terms of uh, these observations, number one, there's large variations in running economy, even when you have elite runners with a narrow range of VO2 max values. And at the same running economy, performance is going to vary. A study by uh, Don Morgan, where he uh, took a wide variety of studies, going back to the original data, and he plotted economy of running versus classif runners classified as untrained, a good runner, sub-elite, and elite runners. And when you look with the black bar indicating the average oxygen cost of running, the average running economy, wouldn't be a surprise to anybody, is that when you go from untrained to elite, you have a better running economy. In fact, it's about a 10% difference between the group. But one of the most important findings in this study is that in any group of runners, including the elite runners, running economy from the poorest to the uh, best runner in terms of running economy varied by 20%. So in elite groups of runners with a 20% variation in running economy, it's very clear that you could have an enormous impact on the final running speed due to this particular variable by itself. So when you look at running economy, uh, running economy translates the performance VO2 into velocity. And running economy varies within any population of runners, as shown in the previous slide. It doesn't matter what group you're in. And variations in running performance in individuals with the same running economy means that some other variables are acting, and for example, percent VO2 max. Marathons are not run at 100% of VO2 max. So if you take these two examples here, where you have a subject whose VO2 max is 70 mils per kilogram minute and can only work at 70% of VO2 max for the entire marathon, the performance VO2 is 49 mils per kilogram minute. You have another subject whose VO2 max is substantially less, 61 mils per kilogram minute, but the individual can work at 80% of maximum. The performance VO2 is also 49 mils per kilogram minute. So performance could be quite similar despite differences in VO2 max. And it goes back to, again to that interaction between 
VO2 max and a percent of VO2 max at which the subject can perform. And you go to this classic slide by Ostrand and Rodal out of their original textbook, and you take a look at marathon distances and you plot what is a near world record pace, you get an estimate of about 80% of VO2 max that the subjects are running at. On the other hand, if you look at a 100 kilometer ultra marathon distance, the world record time of that, the subjects are probably working just south of 60% of VO2 max. So clearly the percent VO2 max that can be maintained is going to vary depending on the distance over which the individual is running. The classic study in this regard is, uh, was done by uh, Farrell in 1979. And he used runners who were heterogeneous in terms about VO2 max and running economy. And they ran a wide variety of races from short ones at uh, just over three kilometers to a marathon distance of 42.2 kilometers. And they measured the onset of plasma lactate accumulation during a treadmill run test. So they went to the lab, did a treadmill run test, blood samples were taken, and they uh, measured uh, the point at which plasma lactate increased. The velocity, you see on a lower axis here with the red arrow, the velocity at the OPLA was the best predictor of performance in the various races. And the VO2 at OPLA, the upper axis, the VO2 at OPLA was the best estimate of the percent VO2 max at which the subject could run. So distance runners appear to, uh, to perform at a pace that allows the highest performance VO2 with minimal lactate accumulation. So when you look at the speed at the lactate threshold, it integrates the variables of both VO2 max and a percent VO2 max, and because the individual is running on the treadmill, it automatically incorporates running economy, and collectively, they shape the velocity at which the individual could run. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Buzzkirk was very interested in running and performance at altitude, and so in the mid-60s, a very important study uh, was conducted, and because there was real concern about what was going to happen to distance runners when they competed at Mexico City in the 1968 Olympics because it was at 2,300 meters altitude. Uh, there was some actually predicting that runners might die, for example. So there was some real concern uh, back then. Uh, Buzzkirk and others took six uh, well-conditioned uh, members of the Penn State uh, track teams uh, who volunteered to go to Nanyoa, Peru, which is at 4,000 meters, to train. The primary goal of the study was to evaluate the impact of training at altitude by measuring changes in VO2 max as well as performance. Uh, this graph shows the uh, going from Penn State University to, to Miami, Florida, and then Lima, Peru, both absolutely at sea level. And then going up to Nanyoa, Peru at 4,000 meters, they stayed up there for 49 days. Three of the subjects returned directly back to Penn State. Three others went on to Mount Evans uh, and with an altitude of 4,375 meters and then stepped down to Alamosa, Denver, and then back to Penn State. The VO2 max uh, decreased about 27% going from uh, Penn State University up to Nanyoa, Peru. It did not change during the time at altitude. Performance was decreased about 14 to 24% during this period of time. Upon return to Penn State, VO2 max was very much the same as before the subjects left. Now they concluded that the quality and quantity of training were reduced at altitude, 4,000 meters, and runners became somewhat detrained. Now if time allowed, I could go into more detail about the subsequent studies that had a dramatic impact on how we look at exercise training at altitude, especially for running performance. But because I can't do that, what I'm going to recommend is that tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, so you have to get up early two days in a row, go to the Dill Lecture. Because you're going to hear an excellent lecture that deals with this topic presented by Dr. Ben Levine. And it will fill you in on all of the history, all of the characters, and I think it is something you just don't want to miss. So in summary, for this section, VO2 max shapes the upper limit of uh, speed and endurance uh, events. But the percent VO2 max interacts with VO2 max to determine the performance VO2. And running economy, of course, translates that performance VO2 into velocity. Any variable, for example, altitude that affects VO2 max, affects performance. Clearly, 
there are other factors that affect performance in endurance events, independent of VO2 max, the type of training, nutrition, environmental factors, heat load, motivation, strategy, and so forth. So it's not a one-dimensional thing. Obviously, I, the focus of this talk is just on VO2 max and oxygen uptake related variables. So uh, keep in mind that there's a lot more going on than that that affects performance. So now in this, this last section, that'll last just a few minutes as I mentioned earlier, uh, VO2 max being related to health and disease. Uh, the link of fitness to health is not new. Uh, that was uh, of interest for the Harvard Fatigue Lab, the Laboratory for Physiological Hygiene. It underpinned an awful lot of what they did in terms of uh, early investigations in the role of nutrition and physical activity linked to coronary heart disease. And so VO2 max, as most of you know, uh, is clearly linked uh, to health outcomes, death from all causes. And again, uh, I'm not going to spend but three slides on this because Barry Franklin did an outstanding job uh, providing uh, insights into this relationship last year. But the a study by Myers and others is a good example of the link between cardiorespiratory fitness and uh, death from all causes in the two different populations of subjects, subjects with cardiovascular disease and normal subjects. And you can see that the de it decreases as you go up in quintiles, that's 20% groupings, quintiles of uh, exercise capacity, meaning VO2 max. What's important to keep in mind, and you saw this in several studies, uh, uh, I'm, I'm in Lee's lecture yesterday and so forth, is that the largest change occurs from those going from the lowest fitness group to the next fitness group. And obviously the risk continues to decrease, but the greatest gain is getting people moving, increasing their VO2 max a bit. Uh, when you look at the effect of changes in fitness, um, as you, individuals who were unfit and became fit, the survivability leveled off. Those who were unfit at one measurement period and remained unfit, survivability was not good. And uh, an increase in VO2 max of about one met is linked to about a 10% increase in survivability. And this, the last slide in this group, is that there's an interaction uh, of, with risk factors. What happens if you take a look at people who differ in cardiorespiratory fitness, low, moderate, and high, and individuals who are hypertensive, systolic blood pressure over 140, and those who are normal tensive, and as you can see, a very similar step-down pattern, uh, indicating that the risk of mortality decreases with increase in fitness, independent of the risk factors. So the presence of a risk factor doesn't mean you shouldn't be active, and uh, again, this study has had an enormous impact on shaping what we recommend to uh, those with chronic diseases. So in my concluding comments, <clears throat> Buzz's contribution encompassed a, a wide range of research questions involving very diverse populations for us to better understand the physiology linked to performance, fitness, and health. His emphasis on a quality of measurement of VO2 max or body composition or plasma volume provides a message to all of us to pay attention to what we measure, especially in this age of automation, where you buy something, plug it in, turn it on, and away you go. You can be so easily fooled. And so there's uh, his message, I think, is you focus attention on the quality of measurement. His concern for students and young professionals is a model to those of you in a room who are in a position now to have a similar impact on younger colleagues. And last but not least, he showed, as no lab continues to do so, that integrative physiology is an effective approach to solve problems across the breadth of exercise physiology. Thank you much. <laughs>